Hi, welcome to the first installment of Radio K. I'm Adam Kadri, and I guess I'll start by explaining what this is about. Let me take you back to 1996, November 20th to be precise. It's a long time ago. Here are some of the news stories from that day. I found these in the LA Times. Whitewater prosecutor Ken Starr gets McDougal tapes. Space shuttle Columbia lifts off for NASA's seventh flight of the year. And peace process falters as Netanyahu government approves expansion of West Bank settlements. So maybe it wasn't as long ago as all that. On that day, I went to the Best Buy in Durham, North Carolina, and I happened across a software collection called Masterpieces of Infocom. And I remembered Infocom text adventures. I hadn't played too many of them, but I certainly couldn't help but notice how they dominated computer game stores back in the 1980s. And here were all their games on one CD for 20 bucks. So I figured I'd check it out. I played a few of the Infocom games that I'd always wanted to try, and then I discovered that on the CD there was a folder containing some games that had been written just the year before by hobbyists using freely available authoring tools. And in fact, it turned out that there was a whole community of folks writing what was now called Interactive Fiction, or IF. So, I wrote some too. Probably the one of mine that's been played the most is called Photopia, but there's also one called 905 that people seem to pass around a lot. And I also tried to keep up with the new pieces other folks were putting out. For instance, there's an annual competition, and I always tried to play through all the games that were submitted to that. At least for a while. The last one I played through was from 2001. And in the 14 years since then, people have sometimes interviewed me, and they'll ask for my opinion on recent developments in IF, and I've had to say, sorry, I don't know any of the recent developments in IF. You know, I kept writing the things for a while afterward, but I stopped playing in 01. So my knowledge of the IF world is frozen at that point. So Radio K is where I'm going to start my attempt to become an unfrozen caveman IF critic. I'm going to pick up where I left off and play a bunch of IF pieces from 2002 and talk about them with folks who are in sort of the same boat I am, people who are familiar with IF, but who haven't played through the whole modern canon. Now, before I bring on my first guest, a quick warning. The spoiler policy for the following discussions is the same as for my calendar articles. That means that spoilers shouldn't be too egregious, but you will be listening to people who have finished these games, and sometimes talking about the most interesting aspects can't be done without giving stuff away. I should also say a little bit about the games that will and will not be appearing on the double-sized premiere here. My fairly arbitrary criteria were to select the top five comp games, the Zizzy Award nominees for best game, and the Zizzy Award winners in the top categories. There was a lot of overlap, and that gave me a list of eight games. Of those, I dropped 1893 because that's a commercial game, and when I tried to purchase it, I found nothing but dead links. And I also dropped Lock and Key because I wrote it. I did not drop Photograph, but my guest for that segment canceled, so I'll have to bump that one to a future installment. But that still leaves us five games to cover, and the first one is Savoir Faire. The first developer most people mention when they talk about 21st Century IF writes under the name Emily Short, and Savoir Faire was her longest game up to that point. It won the 2002 Zizzy Awards for Best Game, Best Story, Best Puzzle, and Best Player Character. It's about an 18th century French dandy who suddenly needs a quick cash infusion, and luckily for him, he has two things going for him. One, he has a connection to a wealthy count he can visit and ask for a loan. And two, he knows magic. With me to discuss Savoir Faire is Claire Parker, who is an IF developer in her own right as well as a reviewer, but I'll let her introduce herself. I'm Claire. I'm a graduate student studying biology, and I came to IF in the fall of 2005 when I was a freshman in college. My then- new boyfriend, now husband, was really into computer games, and I'm not really quite sure how he stumbled into the IF scene, 
but he showed me a few games. I think Photopia was among the first games that he showed me. And I was sort of on again, off again, kind of interested in it. I know kind of more about the idea of IF than I have actually played a lot of the new canon or any of the old Infocom games. So I don't have like a tremendous background, but I am interested in it. And I sort of fell out of paying a lot of attention to it in 2008. I wrote a game for the 2008 comp and found that last sort of month of desperately trying to fix bugs that were beyond my capacity to take care of really very stressful. And that kind of soured me to the experience. So I haven't played that much since 2008, but a couple of Twine games here and there and that sort of thing. Well, if you're going to get back into IF, Savoir Fair is a pretty good place to start. Yeah, I definitely enjoyed it. I've played a few Emily short games before, and this was kind of in the same vein of magical things in this sort of 18th century kind of vibe. I found it just incredibly well polished. I loved that there were very few things that you say, like, look at the chair, and it says you see nothing special about the chair. Well, of course I see something special about the chair. It's an 18th century French chair, totally unusual for me, the player. So it was really nice that they were always implemented. I, I found it very um, immersive, I guess is the right word. That's interesting to me in that one of the evaluative patterns that I have listed on my website, it's, uh, it's pattern four, says that textual description tends to just bounce right off me. It's not that I have no visual imagination, but it's pretty impressionistic. And when I do have a pretty clear mental picture of something I'm reading, I don't know the extent to which that picture bears any resemblance to what the text actually told me. But it sounds like your visual imagination may be stronger than mine. Yeah, I think I do have a pretty visual imagination. I actually find it really difficult in some IF games when you walk into a room. This was sort of the problem that I had when I wrote my own. You walk into a room and it sort of says, oh, it's it's a room filled with some stuff that belongs in a living room. And I just can't quite imagine like what sort of stuff are they talking about? What kind of a living room? What What is the taste of the person who lives there? What is their aesthetic? And so I, I found that those sorts of descriptive elements were really useful for me in kind of filling in what this space looked like. So yeah, so when I was writing my game, I sort of wanted to describe and implement every imaginable object because that was sort of how it was built building the room in my mind was having all of these things and all of their aesthetic. So yeah, so there were a lot of visual details that I found useful. It is kind of difficult to keep track of specific details. It's more about building an atmosphere than about keeping track of what exactly was in Emily Short's mind and transferring that to my mind. So there were a couple of things that I missed in the text that were kind of important details that I didn't see. Like the machine in the kitchen, there's sort of a food making machine in the kitchen and describes it as having these compartments and these dials and these space to put a little recipe in. And I sort of thought I understood it, but I didn't fully read it. So I didn't actually understand that there was a dial that you could turn. And so in that sense, I find text-based games rather hard to relate to because if you miss a detail, you can't spot where you missed it. Yeah, I admit I have almost no mental picture of that machine at all. Do you think that would have been more intuitive if this had been one of those LucasArts games like Monkey Island? Yeah, I mean, I've played quite a few graphical adventure games. And I think one of the things that was interesting for me, I don't think it's really a problem with Sad Warfare. It's just kind of an interesting note about these text-based games as opposed to games with a graphical element, is that certain things are actually quite difficult to keep track of, especially text which is kind of weird. You'd think in a text-based game, objects that are sort of texts would be really easy to keep track of, but they were all described by some kind of adjective, like the crumpled paper or the burnt paper or the old letter or the unfinished letter. And you had to remember this kind of adjective to remember where the information was. And I find that keeping track of that is a lot easier for me if there's a visual element to it. It's actually something that my mom has talked about a lot to me. She works in publishing and her sort of idea about ebooks is that in an ebook, all of the information is kind of unmapped, that you can't really tell where you learned a thing from the book. Where if you have a physical book, you kind of develop a sense about where in the book you found the information. And I found that to be very true in this IF game, that it was very difficult for me to remember where I had learned a particular piece of information. So I'd have to look through every single piece of paper in my giant inventory in order to find, you know, the name of a person that I needed to know or some clue that was in there somewhere, but I couldn't remember where it was. 
Yeah, that thing about ebooks strikes me as very true. I am kind of a Luddite in some ways. Like, I still don't own a smartphone. But I do read ebooks, and I have noticed that when I want to quote something from a physical book, like for an article on my website, I'll remember that, yeah, that line was on a left facing page near the bottom about two thirds of the way through. And you're right, I can't do that for ebooks. So I guess it's a good thing they have search functions. Yeah, I feel like that's definitely true. Um, sometimes in graphical games, they'll give you sort of like a folder or a sort of a dossier of little scraps of paper that you can kind of leaf through and you can see what they look like. Or even if they're just little icons in your inventory, they look different and looking different is kind of different than being described differently. It kind of imprints on a different part of my brain that can kind of tag back to what that information was in an easier way than a word can associate with that chunk of information. You know what occurs to me? Not only do you end up carrying around a bunch of different scraps of paper, but you also end up carrying around like a pantry's worth of food items. And I did have mental pictures for some of them, but not for things like the exotic cheeses. Like it says clove of garlic, and I immediately think of a specific clove of garlic. Or it says lentils, and I can very clearly picture a handful of lentils, but then it says salaire, and I just think of a written word on a screen, because I've never seen a salaire, and sure, I can type examine salaire, but the description just bounces right off me. And I think the papers worked the same way, at least for me. They did all have adjectives attached, but those adjectives were just words on a screen. You know what was sort of hilarious about Sad Warfare? Is if you put a food item on the ground, then he won't eat it. I thought that was just the most brilliant thing ever. I didn't notice that. Like, you know, I had so much stuff. I like put some junk on the ground and then I was like, oh, I wonder what happens if you eat the mint. And he wouldn't eat it. And I was like, that's brilliant. <laughs> it was great. Yeah. Savoir Fair is full of little touches like that. I want to mention another one. But first, I guess I should fill in some backstory for the listeners here. So those of us who were really active in the interactive fiction community got to know Emily back in 1999, but she made her first really big splash with a game in the year 2000 called Galatea. The whole thing was a single conversation, but the file size was huge, relatively speaking. And part of that was because there were so many different turns the conversation could take that some of it was because the conversation wasn't just branching. You could ask about anything you wanted, and the program would evaluate the context and do some pretty complex emotional modeling before triggering a response. And she did another one of these in 2001 called Best of Three. And that one wasn't as well received, mainly because in Galatea, you're talking to this cool animate statue, and in Best of Three, it's this horrible guy who's like 20 years old and carries around an 18th century sword stick. I was like, man, I hate this guy. This is the worst guy ever. <laughs> <laughs> so even though I've kept in touch with Emily herself, uh, she's actually a good friend of mine, I hadn't kept up with her work, I have to admit. So I went to her website to get this game, not knowing anything about it. And I saw that she'd done a mock-up of Savoir Fair as an Infocom game. And I thought, oh, how about that? For those who weren't buying computer games in the 80s, uh, Infocom was the big mainstream IF publisher back then. And it was experimental in its way, but those gray boxes have come to signify certain qualities. Games that are long, professionally written, and full of puzzles. And once I got into Savoir Faire, I saw that, yeah, it was like Emily was saying, so you think I can only do conversation games? Well, here's one with no one to talk to. And I think that to a certain extent, she was also trying to show off a little for other IF programmers. Like, at the very beginning, I saw that I was standing next to a well and wearing a hat, so I took off the hat and filled it with water, you know, as you do. And then I drank some of the water, and I saw that as I did, 
the listing in the inventory went from saying that the hat was filled to the brim to saying that there was now a little room to saying it was about half full. And I thought, criminy, she's tracking the liquid levels. And the thing is, handling liquids was a notorious problem in IF programming because to handle them robustly, you have to account for the way that they can be divided up among several containers and they can make other objects wet and on and on and on. And Savoir Faire sort of felt like Emily saying, yeah, people, that doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means you have to do all that stuff like I just did. Yeah, it's sort of interesting because as somebody who has like very little coding experience and has never coded anything with liquid in it, sort of one of the problems about being really good at designing something is that when things don't quite work out, those are the times that you notice. So if you if you try and like fill a wine bottle from the well, it says like the mouth is too narrow, you need a funnel. And you're like, well, not if I was filling it from the well, I would dip it in the well. But, you know, that's such a, a small nitpick that it's only the sort of, you know, the one thing you didn't think of that stands out to a person who hasn't coded. Whereas for a person who has coded, it's all of the things that worked out well. Yeah, the coding isn't perfect. I was noting down bugs as I played, and I hit 11 of them. And I wasn't even trying weird stuff, usually. I was pretty surprised that the beta testers back in O2 didn't catch these. But before we move on, uh, I feel like I should say explicitly that I liked this game a lot more than I was expecting to. A few minutes ago, I mentioned my list of evaluative patterns. And pattern 14 says that I love it when an author thoroughly thinks through the premise. And Savoir Faire is a great example with all of the different ways that you end up using the linking magic. Yeah, I really liked it too. I mean, I didn't really know what to expect exactly. I played some of Emily's other games that also have some kind of puzzle elements as well. I really enjoyed it. She wrote on her website or somewhere or other, that she wanted it to be sort of a learning experience that you could, you know, you figure out how the links work and then you like learn how to use them in other ways. And I feel like that was very effective and really, um, it really made you feel like you were figuring out this world and that the world was very consistent. And I really found that very kind of thrilling. It wasn't like each puzzle was its own individual little thing living in its own little universe. They were all connected as part of like how one universe works together. And that, that's just a really wonderful thing to see in a game, that everything is part of one collective set of rules that all work in predictable ways. I, I really found it like quite lovely to play, except for those parts where I got stuck. Yeah, I didn't get stuck because I played with a walkthrough. Like I just suggested, I wasn't expecting to like this very much, because as much as I like writing IF, I've never really been a big fan of playing it. And I'm hopeless at Infocom type games. The one actual Infocom game I bought when it was released was Trinity. And I played it for a year. And I never even made it out of the prologue until I got a hint book. So my approach in Savoir Faire was that each time I entered a room, I would do everything I could think of. And then I went straight to the walkthrough to see whether I'd missed anything. And you might think that that would ruin it, but... Well, let me put it this way. For most of the time I've been away from IF, I've been working as a screenwriter, and I got hired specifically on the basis of my experience as an IF writer. Like, the sorts of scenes I got asked to write tended to be ones in which the heroes got into a scrape and then had to cleverly get out of the scrape. So, for me, playing this with the walkthrough was just like reading a great movie script. You know, I'd read through the commands, and it would dawn on me how Pierre, the main character, was using magic in a new way to get to a new area of the house, and it'd be a real wow moment. And there were like half a dozen of these wow moments. And I say that if you've got a story with half a dozen wow moments in it, well, that's a hell of a story. And the fact that it was Pierre being clever rather than me being clever didn't bother me at all. 
That seems like a good way to play these kinds of IF games. I tend to get stuck and then I use hints and it feels very frustrating to me because like there were parts where I was like, oh, I was like so close to solving this. Like maybe if I just tried a little bit harder and looked for more clues, I could have figured it out. By the end of it, I was really pretty much basically just using a walkthrough. I just read every hint for every puzzle and then I was like, okay, I can do it now. But there were a few puzzles that I'm glad that I didn't use any walkthrough everything meshed together in my brains in such a satisfying way. Like the yellow hangings puzzle, you have the yellow hangings and you have to figure out how to get rid of them. And it was basically like everything just clicked immediately. I'd read the right book beforehand. I'd seen the right recipes beforehand. I figured out how everything worked. And so when I walked in that room, it was like, oh, like, brilliant. I got this. I, I like understand how all the pieces fit together. I just have to figure out how to implement that. That's a really satisfying experience to have. But then once you get to a point where you can't solve any more from there and you have to go to the walkthrough, then it's sort of unsatisfying because it's like, oh, like I was, I I had the pieces, but I just couldn't make it work together. And and it brings in this kind of element of frustration that, you know, you don't, you don't really get to enjoy that lateral thinking because your, your brain didn't quite make that leap far enough. Okay. So I think we both wanted to talk about the thematic implications of the magical system in Savoir Faire. So take it away. Yeah, so so the magical system of the game is very tied up with class. The system of magic is called the Lavori Darachni. I don't know if I'm saying that right. But anyway, so it says, From the earliest times, the Lavori has been practiced only by those of the most privileged classes, whether because, as the practitioners themselves would like to claim, it is an innate nobility that runs in the blood of the best of men, or because, as their opponents most vehemently insist, It is a skill too closely guarded for anyone of lesser breeding to be allowed its acquisition. So only the nobility of this universe have access to this magical capacity. And it's pretty unclear whether that's some sort of genetic thing or whether that's because they are the only ones who have, you know, they, they, they guard their knowledge closely. But it seems to me like there's, there's something there that's not learnable about the Lavori. So Pierre is not noble. He was a peasant of some sort and then he gained the power of of magic through this random chain of events and then was raised by this noble family so what struck me about it is that it doesn't seem like like linking this this capacity for this magic is is something that could be learned it's it's like it's something that's innate that's in the blood that's maybe genetic or can only be attained by these like sort of select few what that really made me think about is what magic means in all these various media you know obviously magic is not a real thing but what is it a metaphor for i guess is what i'm thinking so in this case it seems like it's kind of a metaphor for all of the things that noble people can do that the lower classes can't do so the example that came to my mind was literacy so noble people might be able to read whereas peasants can't read. And is that because the peasants are incapable of learning to read, or is it because they are denied every opportunity from earliest childhood to attain that knowledge? Yeah, I don't know enough to speak about the peasantry of Bourbon, France, but certainly in the antebellum American South, there were heavy penalties for teaching a slave to read. Right. But as you were saying. It seems like a lot of times in fantasy, We like having magic as this special thing that marks certain people as special. And I feel like that's kind of dangerous. Just like there's people who are brilliant at music and there's people who are only okay at music, but saying that there are people who are incapable of learning music as a general class of people seems antithetical to the way I think about the world. And I think it's interesting that we put the idea of magic in this box of things that it's okay for some people not to be able to know. So... I don't really think that Emily Short is trying to say that peasants or lower classes are worse people than the aristocracy, but there is this kind of notion in having an innate ability that can't be learned that that suggests that aristocracy is somehow innately superior. That's the sort of thing that seems so explicitly evil a way to think that it's hard to believe that anyone could actually put that forward in a serious manner you know obviously i don't think either of us thinks that emily is making a pro aristocracy argument no of course not but there are people who do and one of my least favorite movies and people always are shocked when i say this but i absolutely despised 
the movie The Incredibles. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. because Brad Bird very explicitly is saying that some people are better than others. And that it's evil to try and be as good as those other people. Exactly. And the bad guy is the one who tries to remove inborn inherent advantages and access to power. Someone who tries to level the playing field so that everyone has equality of opportunity is the villain. And I think it's interesting that we think about these sort of like supernatural capacities as being somehow special. I mean, like, obviously they are special and different in that they don't exist, but that they should be outside of our modern liberal sensibilities, that they're somehow sort of old fashioned or they can belong to this old fashioned realm of ideas where some people are better than other people. Well, a lot of people will tell you, especially on the bottom half of the Internet, that uh, if you have an outsized share of money and power, that you must have done something to deserve it. And, well, first of all, that's increasingly untrue. And by increasingly, I mean that since 1980, social class in the U.S. has become more determined by your birth than it was in most of the 20th century. So wealth is less likely these days to have been earned and more likely to have been inherited. But even the wealth that is supposedly earned what does that even mean? People say that you become successful in this society by being smart or having an elite talent or just plain hard work, but intelligence and talent and even just that sort of endurance are also accidents of birth. So in a way, it's just another kind of aristocracy. And some of it isn't even like genetic. You know, I, I study stress physiology as my job and a lot of this stuff is determined by the nutrition that you got as an infant or the tr nutrition that your mother got while she was pregnant or the hormones that your mother had when she was pregnant. And these things are have really powerful and lasting effects that mean that some people, just for reasons that aren't their own fault, won't be able to be as healthy or to have the space in their brain that's devoted to higher thinking because that space is being taken up by the day-to-day -day struggles of trying to stay alive. Yeah. There's a blogger who goes by the name Atrios, who I agree with like 98% of the time, but a lot of that 2% disagreement comes from the way that he tends to sneer at people who are bothered by things that don't bother him. To choose a pretty innocuous example... He's a big fan of public transit that runs on overhead cables. And pretty frequently, he makes fun of people who complain that having a net of wires overhead is ugly and depressing. Well, it is ugly and depressing. And, you know, you would know a lot more about this than I do. But my understanding is that the extent to which things bother you in general is determined to a great extent by your neural architecture. And so I read these posts and I think, dude, stop thinking you're better than other people just because your amygdala doesn't function the same way theirs does. But uh, anyway, I'm getting pretty far afield. So back to Savoir Faire. Um, I wonder about the causality here. Like in the world of this story, is the idea that magical ability was initially randomly distributed in the population and then people who had it used it to become the aristocracy? Well, yeah, okay, sure. But, you know, that's what people thought. That's called social Darwinism, you know? That's the idea that the people who, you know, are the best will rise to the top. And I, I, do, I don't agree with that. It's, it's untrue. It's, there's, there's too many problems with it. For example, the fact that it's not like aristocrats only have babies with other aristocrats, right? Like surely they have babies with all sorts of servant girls out there. What happens to their kids? Do they not have this magical ability? Well, a few years ago, I read every book by George Orwell, and he certainly believed that people are interchangeable across social classes. Uh, there's a quote from Down and Out in Paris and London that stuck with me. He says that the average millionaire is only the average dishwasher dressed in a new suit. And Savoir Faire makes this explicit in that Pierre's chief characteristic is that he's a snobby aristocrat. 
He's sort of a watered-down Primo Veracella. But we learn that if not for a twist of fate and a magic spell, he would have grown up to be a dishwasher or rustic equivalent. Right. But as long as we're talking about the political implications of the Lavori Darachne, here's one for you. As noted, as the game goes on, we see all sorts of different facets of the linking magic in this world. But a really basic example would be something like this. And I'm going to change some details here to avoid spoilers. Say that you're standing in front of a white door, and it's locked, and you don't have the key. But you do have a book with a white cover. So you link the book to the door, and when you open the book, the door swings open too. And I couldn't help but think the fact that this link is presented as magical and clearly contrary to the way the real world works, highlights how superficial the similarities are and how deep the differences are. Like, yeah, they're both white and they both open, but a door isn't like a book in any meaningful way, which is what makes the link magic. And it seemed to me that this resonated with the way a lot of people talk about politics. They take what they're familiar with and they just scale it up. They say things like, Saddam Hussein's like a bully on the playground and you gotta smack him in the mouth. Or a congressman saying, when times are tough, you have to cut back on your spending, so the government should too. And I think that by foregrounding the way that these sorts of analogies are marked more by their differences than by their similarities, Savoir Faire ends up showing off that so are the analogies that people use in political discourse. I mean, sorry, but global geopolitics is not a playground. And the U.S. government, with its $3 trillion budget and its ability to levy taxes and print money, is not a household. They're as different as a book and a door. And, um... One of the things about the game specifically is that the similarities between objects is kind of purely perceptual. It doesn't even have to like be grounded in reality. So one of the puzzles depends on you need two things to be the same color. Well, you just shine a colored light on one of them and that makes it look the same color. So like, there you go. Now they're the same color when it hasn't actually changed anything fundamental about the object itself or even what you know about the object is just the color that you're seeing it in. So it's quite surface level indeed. And that's it for Savoir Faire. One thing I should note before moving on is that this is my first time trying to put together a program like this, and I have no idea what I'm doing. So I've just learned that in the future, I should probably make sure to record a sign-off at the end of each segment. That was sort of like in TV and the movies where people just hang up the phone without saying goodbye. Live and learn. Next up, we have Another Earth, Another Sky by Paul O'Brien which is the middle chapter of the Earth and Sky series about a brother-sister superhero team. In this one, you play the brother. It won first place in the 2002 comp, and it also won the Zizzy Award for Best Use of Medium. And here to discuss it with me is Jess Haskins, who I met many jobs ago in Poughkeepsie, New York, when I trained her to be an SAT tutor. Months after that, I discovered that she had a very interesting blog that was mostly about web games, and now she's a pro game developer. But I'll let her tell that story. Here's Jess. I'm Jess Haskins. I'm a game designer, narrative designer, and writer based in Brooklyn, New York. And I'm currently a creative director of a studio called What Pumpkin Studios. We ran a Kickstarter project to fund an adventure game based on Homestuck, the cult hit webcomic by Andrew Hussey. It was actually a massively successful Kickstarter. So it's a sort of classic 3D point and click adventure game, sort of in the vein of old LucasArts adventures or like Telltale in the early days before they went all Walking Dead style. Sort of like big world, big cast of characters, very story driven, lots of kind of like zany humor and like, you know, interesting world building. Prior to that, I was at a studio where um, basically every project we did was a completely different platform and genre from the past project that we did. 
But my sort of like true love and the thing I always come back to is I'm very interested in narrative, very story driven games and adventure games, which is what I grew up playing other than like Super Mario Brothers, um, which was like my first game game. Actually, the NES port of King's Quest V was like my first adventure game. And then I wound up playing basically just the whole King's Quest series with my father. We'd play them together and we'd, you know, sit and try and solve the puzzles and like make all the maps on graph paper and kind of like played our way through the Sierra canon that way. So yeah, adventure games were always uh, that sort of like, you know, the, the like first genre that I really got into. So by the time King's Quest V came along, commercial text games were already a thing of the past. So how did you come to discover interactive fiction? So I, I don't know when exactly I came to them, but I did play you know, some Infocom games. I played like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy game, which I never could finish. Also Zork, uh, ditto, never could finish, but I gave it a good try. I actually played MUDs for a while. Um, I was even once briefly a god, and then once I accidentally let a priceless god level cloak of invisibility fall into a player's hands and they picked it up and I had to like reappear and be like um could I have that back please I was sort of aware of the IF community just because I was sort of aware of kind of all these other little homebrew communities that were like kind of made and like shared online I don't know that I played any of them all that deeply, but I was in a master's program, design and technology at Parsons. We had a course on narrative and dynamic systems and were actually assigned to play a bunch of IF titles sort of as part of that. So I played uh, like Shade uh, by Andrew Plotkin. It was like one of the assignments. I played a few of your games, actually. I played Photopia and Shrapnel and I think a lot of the more out there, like artistic, experimental stuff, and not even so much of what's probably the more, you know, normal IF. I played all of the stuff that was like riffing on that, but not actually the basics. Now, before we get to Another Earth, Another Sky, uh, it's a game meant to evoke superhero comics. So how familiar were you with those going in? I'm into comics as a medium, and I always kind of say that with the caveat, but not really superhero comics. I'm more familiar with it as a genre like expressed through other media, like Joss Whedon's Dr. Horrible sing-along blog. So more movie and TV adaptations than superhero comics. Um, I'm not that interested in the comics themselves, but I think like the superhero world is... You know, I think of it as a genre like any other, like, you know, Westerns or space opera. And there's, like, superhero comics. And I definitely had fun with other media playing in that genre. And when I would go into a comic shop, it was often just to get comics based on TV shows, which probably makes me, like, a horrible comics fan. And I'm sure that there's, like, a special section reserved for the people who only come in for TV comics. But I get, like, my Star Trek comics and, like, you know, Doctor Who and Firefly and Gargoyles and all that stuff. And and then other than that, the, the sort of, like, autobiographical comics and, you know, more just surreal storytelling stuff. Like, I was actually a fan of Neil Gaiman, like, Sandman series and stuff like that. So that's me in comics basically all of the parts of the shop except the superhero ones. So in the first segment, I was talking with Claire Parker about Savoir Faire, which is a game in which the puzzles aren't just random, but are actually kind of thematic. You solve them by using this particular type of magic in different ways. And one of the nice things about a player character with superpowers is that to a great extent, the same thing applies. You're not just doing random stuff to overcome obstacles, but you're using your power set in different ways. The guy in this game happens to be one of those bruiser types. He's super strong and can fall a mile and just stand up and dust himself off instead of going splat. So what did you think about the way that this game made use of a player character like that? Yeah, playing that super strong bruiser type was one of the adjustments that I had to make in order to figure out like how to solve this world and how to approach problems because coming at it from like the adventure game player's perspective, 
And it usually is about tricky little puzzles and it's not a shooter. It's not an action game. It's about the brainy hero who uses their wits and cleverness and smooth talking skills to survive and get past stuff. And like, there's a door in your way. You're not just going to hammer down the door. You need to like sweet talk the guard and like get them to look the other way and then fish around and get the key and enter a code. And so actually just having the solution be break down door is a very different way of thinking. I should mention that the Earth and Sky series actually isn't the first superhero serial in the IF world. Neil DeMoss had a three-part series about a superhero team called the Frenetic Five. And in the Frenetic Five, you play a guy called Improv, whose power is to cleverly solve puzzles using random stuff he picks up for no particular reason. And the joke, of course, is that that's what every adventure game character did back in the old days. So I thought it was kind of refreshing that Another Earth, Another Sky is a true hybrid, where your powers extend beyond being an adventure game character. It's a game where, very often, violence actually is the answer to this one. Actually, that's the part that gave me the most trouble, too. Like, the one place I got really stuck was that door that you could not open, you could not break, you could not tear off its hinges, you couldn't punch the wall. I think it was supposed to be easy, but I got stuck there for a really long time. <laughs> yeah, IF is kind of notorious for guess-the-verb puzzles, and to the extent that this one is even supposed to be a puzzle, it kind of falls into that category. Like in Savoir Faire, when I saw the solution to a puzzle, I'd think, oh, wow, that's a really clever way to use your powers. And in this one, it was like, oh, yeah, I forgot to try pulling on the door instead of pounding on it. Whoops. And that's not quite as rewarding. That is one of the times where I experimented the most with Emily. I had her fly. I'm like, oh, maybe she can go on the roof and like break the glass dome and fly in and let me in from the other side. And I'd try and all this stuff. But if I hadn't gotten stuck there for so long, then it would have been less interaction and less thinking about Emily's powers and trying to use them. I, I was kind of sad that I couldn't break the dome and have her walk in. I thought like, oh, that's got to be it. Now, once you get to the tiny planet on the other side of the portal, the game actually does shift into a more conventional mode with some traditional puzzles along with just using your super strength. So thoughts on that section? I liked it. I liked the parts of the puzzle that were basically just about figuring out the orientation of the world and traversal and how to get from one spot to another and how the system of chambers and transports worked. That part felt really satisfying and was pretty simple. It wasn't like overcomplicated. But the part where like you have to get the water from one section to another like without spilling it and based on knowledge of the geography and which direction you can go, that part all seemed pretty cool. It reminded me just in the way that the environments and the locations were set up kind of very spare, like there's not a whole lot that you can interact with or pick up or poke or manipulate. The, the zones were very iconic. You know, here's the rainforest zone it's you know very simple and has just like one button and you know one creature and here's the desert zone and it's just got like one thing going on it made me think of playing like an early graphical adventure i was reminded of loom or other ega games in that period where the environments are very sparse and there's only like one or two interactable objects and it's more just about the sort of system underlying them and the iconography it's funny you should say that because Claire and I were talking about how Savoir Faire made us think of a LucasArts game. You know, imagining one type of adventure game as another type of adventure game rather than as a movie or as real life. And what's particularly interesting to me about this is that Another Earth, Another Sky isn't even trying to evoke real life or graphical adventure games, but comic books. One of the distinctive features of the game is that when you and Emily do use your powers, it shows you graphics of words like crash and kerpow in fancy fonts, like in comics. Except, I think the main thing people associate with that sort of thing, and maybe I'm dating myself here, but I think the main thing people think of when they see biff, pow, bam, is... The Batman TV show from the 60s. Yeah. So it's sort of like an IF game trying to be a TV show, trying to be a comic book. You know, stylized representations referring to different stylized representations and 
only several links down the chain do you get to anything like reality. It's very postmodern for good or for ill. Yeah, and I, I actually did like the help file suggested and changed my font to a comic booky looking font, but not Comic Sans. I was a little offended at that suggestion. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I liked the little for the sound effects. Uh, I guess maybe one reason that they also evoke the like Batman TV show thing is they come as an interruption. Like, you know, in a comic book, they're just part of the overall graphic you know layout of the page and they're just there. But it's in the TV show where like we cut away from the main medium which is this live action cinematic stuff to like a graphic that flashes on screen so the graphic sort of flashing in the middle of your regular old text is sort of that same effect i think yeah now that you say that it sort of makes me wonder whether paul chose text because it best fit the game that he had in mind or whether it was just because text makes it a lot easier to write an adventure game by yourself in a feasible amount of time but that said, the IF half of the hybrid does outweigh the comic book half once you go through the portal and onto the tiny planet. Yeah, it was a tiny little world, but it, it had a system and a purpose behind it and felt very cohesive. And I liked that. And it also reminded me of a Star Trek text adventure that I'd played uh, called The Promethean Prophecy, which I still claim is actually the best Star Trek game I've ever played. Very very iconic locations that all have like a highly symbolic function and characters moving around in the background that you can't quite communicate with so not a lot of dialogue more just like observation and sort of figuring out the functions of places which is I imagine probably a fairly common thing in IF too in general I got the sense that yes this feels very kind of like classic yeah being on your own and not being able to communicate with the creatures you do encounter is very IF what did you think of the alien creatures I liked them. They were made, you know, nice background and they had lots of varied behavior, which was pretty cool. The parrots got a bit repetitive, but I guess that's what parrots do. The squid was the one that I thought because it was one creature that was there and was focused on me and paying attention to me and interacting with me. I'm like, All right, this is a puzzle. I got to communicate with this squid. I'm like, it's been a long time trying to talk to that squid and draw marks and dance around. I gave him like every single object in my inventory. I'm like, oh, here, here I have this notepad, even though it's underwater. It'll probably be fine. Maybe you can like solve these equations on here or something. I don't think there's a way to actually break through with the squid, but I had fun trying, I guess, but I also felt like that was the direction I needed to go. And it's, of course, possible if you just like zip through everything to never even meet the squid because it doesn't even show up until later. Now, one character you can talk to, at least before you get separated, is your sister, Emily, the sky in Earth and Sky. She's not super funny. She's not all that helpful. And in this segment, she doesn't even really do a whole lot. She just kind of hangs around and occasionally kibitzes. But uh, nevertheless, I was surprised at how much richer the game experience felt when she was around. It was strange. Like, when I was trying to figure out how to make progress, like, how do I get into that drawer? How do I open that door? Stuff like that. The fact that I had someone else there to consult somehow made me feel less inclined to give up, even though, you know, I know perfectly well that she's just a pretty small chunk of code. You know, the computer sees your sister as a string of ones and zeros. So did you find that having Emily around added to the game, even though she wasn't particularly active? That's sort of my approach to friendly NPCs in games in general. I like having companion characters. I like lots of dialogue and asking them about everything and quip while you're wandering around or the whatever character is like your advisor or sort of helper character in the game, the one that you can kind of return to all the time and say, what about this thing? And they give you a little background or like, maybe you can try this and that. Like, I'm always into that in general. So I, I thought she made a good conversational partner. I liked the way that dialogue was handled, where you can just talk to and get you know, a chunk about whatever is going on. You don't necessarily have to figure out everything that's a trigger and like ask about this noun that you mentioned and ask about this noun that I saw in the room and ask about this thing that I think maybe you might have something to say about. I mean, you can do that too, but that's not the only way to drag information out. Now on what I expect will be a less happy note, what did you think of Emily, not just as a resource, but as a character? 
you know, what did you think of her role in the story? Yeah, I was a little disappointed. Um, actually, the the thing that really irked me was the part where she, who is my, you know, conversational helper character that I can ask about stuff and get more insight about stuff from, tells me that she's not going to deal with any of this, like, complicated science stuff and, like, all the diagrams and notes that are left around because that's my arena. Math class is tough. Yeah, like, well, we're both apparently the kids of these super dedicated super scientists. And I'm, I mean, just going by like, you know, stereotype, I'm the big, big hulky guy with the strength and endurance powers. So I'm the brawn of the operation, but I guess I'm the brains too. It's like, what do you do as part of this team? In the beginning, it talked about finding these suits and like, and one fits your sister. So her main attribute seems to be, I mean, other than being kind of perky and fun conversation as part of this world saving duo that we are, her main attribute is having a body that fits into the suit with all the cool flying and zappy powers. So that was a little disappointing. That could have been overcome if she played a bigger role in the action of the story, where her main goals are to fearfully like try to prevent you from walking through the big plot gate that is where the adventure starts, and then asking you to make a decision for her, and then if she goes with you, getting captured and damseled, and you have to just save her at the end where she's been sitting around. I didn't mind getting separated and was like looking forward to, oh, at the end when I like find her, we meet up again. I'll like, you know, hear about all the cool ass kicking she's been doing or maybe even play it. Like maybe we'll switch off and I'll play her like getting out of her cell and landing somewhere else and solving some problems. But no, she didn't even have a force field in her cell and she still couldn't get out. She just sits there and waits for you to show up and drag her off to the end credits. So, yeah, I was disappointed with that. I think my comment to you is like, where's her game? And you told me that was actually in the previous one. But I don't know, somehow that still didn't make up for it all. Yeah, that's right. I do wonder about the extent to which the problems you've pointed out about Emily's portrayal are ameliorated by playing the first game in which Emily is the main character. Now, the answer might be not so much. You know, this installment, Another Earth, Another Sky, won the 2002 IF competition, but the first installment, which was just called Earth and Sky, came in eighth, and people complained that there wasn't much to it. You know, you get a note saying to come to the lab, you find the suit, your brother Austin walks you through a test of your powers, and then you have to distract a monster while... Austin comes up with a way to turn that monster back into a human, and that's it. Game over. And people said, okay, interesting teaser, but not much happened, and now I have to wait a year for part two. And here too, just when you reconnect with Emily and are ready to actually start accomplishing your goal of finding your parents, it's the end. Tune in next time. So what did you think of the serial nature of the game? Yeah, it, it didn't occur to me until just now, but I guess that's also part of the imitating the comic book form, a kind of brief adventures, and there's a whole bunch of history that went before that's really breathlessly summarized so that you at least have some sense of what's going on, and then it's like, and stay tuned for next time. So that, I, I suppose, is intentional and definitely part of the thing, and also part of the reason I don't read superhero comics, because there's no beginning and no end. And I'm kind of a completist. I like to start things at the beginning and like, all right, if you tell me that there are 80 parts to this story, then I am going to start at part one and read my way all the way through to part 80, which I didn't do in this case, just as a fun exercise. Like, all right, I'll go dive in the middle without any idea what comes before or after and just see how it is on its own. And it is supposed to stand on its own, or at least that's what the accompanying notes say. They say that if you've played the first one, awesome. And if you haven't, no worries. So, yeah, as someone who only played the middle portion, what do you think? Was it a good idea to make this a serial? Or should Paul have waited until 04 when he had the whole thing finished and released the entire series as a single story that might feel more balanced? 
possibly. I mean, with the exception that now that I've realized it, having the comic book imitating short little episode with Cliffhanger um, is kind of thematically appropriate. But I guess I expected this game to be part two and three. I'm like, all right, well, this is going to be the one where we're going to use the two of us running around exploring and solving puzzles by using a combination of super strength and fog and flying and zapping and falling and hitting and find our parents and like get to the end. So I feel like all of that set up about the having the two powers and that you have a companion character and you can ask her to do things like we never got the payoff for that. And so in the sense that by playing this game, I was led to expect that and it didn't happen in this game. Really, I don't think it stands alone that well. Also, just a ton of the items that you get, you don't really find out that much about the meaning of the notes. Actually, you find out a lot more if you do like I didn't do in the first playthrough and get the headset. Yeah. Understand. I I missed the headset the first time, too. So there, I guess you get a little bit more explanation, like sort of understand the notes. But I feel like I'm carrying around all these things that I never use. And there's all these hints that I never get to follow up on because that's all in the sequel. Which is fine, like episodic games are fine to an extent, but I wouldn't say, oh yeah, play this, it's a totally like standalone game. I'd say, yeah, play this if you have played part one, and then we'll play part three when it comes out. Okay, so any final thoughts? Yeah, just that I did enjoy it. This one was pleasantly easy, and I'm a fan of condensed little experiences that you can get in just a few hours, and I definitely liked it on that level, and would like to play more things like this. And that wraps up the first half of the double-size premiere of Radio K. I hope you'll continue on to part two, but first, a quick request. I've got a lot of games to get through, and I'll need a lot of help. So if you'd like to be a guest on this series, and you meet the criteria, that is, you're familiar with interactive fiction and know how it works, but you haven't played every top game of the past decade plus, I'd love to hear from you. Just go to my website at adamkadri.ac and click on the stamp. Thanks for listening, and on to part two.